Good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. We're very excited for this conversation. I think it really flows nicely from the, the previous conversations. Today, we are talking about equity and ESG in the muni markets, looking at risks, disclosure, and adoption. My name is Caitlin McLean. I'm a Senior Director of Innovative Finance at the Milken Institute, and very pleased to have a fantastic panel um, who is going to talk a lot about some of the best practices and opportunities in the muni market for better integration of ESG. So very briefly to do some scene, set, scene setting, I think we've heard from, from the panels this morning, the real need for investment um, in our communities, not only in things like infrastructure, but also in terms of leveling the playing field for social, for social equity, you know, going through this pandemic, looking at you know, kind of our health risks. So really understanding you know, what are the investments that we need to make to both address potential environmental, social, and governance risks, but also to look at maximizing impact. And so today we are going to talk to the panelists and hear from them, not necessarily about the challenges. I'm sure many of you who've come to this session and, and sign up for this uh, understand the, the challenges around things like standardization of metrics and uh, challenges around pricing and how and when to disclose. So we're going to, to, to put that aside a bit and really focus on what are some of the practical ways that um, whether you're an issuer, you're an investor, you're an underwriter, a across the kind of stakeholder spectrum in the municipal market, how can you really begin to think about uh, adoption and, and integration of ESG into your day-to-day -day life? So I'm going to skip uh, formal introductions because there's a lot to cover in this conversation and we want to dive right in. So Gary, if I can go to you first, Gary Hall is, I'm sure everyone knows, a uh, partner and head of investment banking for infrastructure and public finance at Siebert William Shank. He's also part of our executive committee um, for our, our uh, public finance council here at the Milken Institute. Gary, I think you know, you've know you really been from the supply side, if we're looking at this from a supply and demand um, you know, kind of component, looking at the supply side and working with issuers and really trying to help them navigate, you know, what are the risks that they should be assessing? How are they thinking about disclosing to meet both what they should in terms of materiality, but also what investors are demanding, right? And that's that's a tricky, um, you know, kind of road to uh, bridge to walk on. So, you know, would love to hear from you some what you're seeing in terms of some of the, you know, kind of case studies for how you actually start thinking about what risks to, to assess and, and disclose. And what are some of those kind of best practices you're seeing? Yeah, thanks, Caitlin. Well, uh, unfortunately, we don't enjoy what we see in the corporate market where there's quantifiable, demonstrable evidence that there's about a five to seven basis point pricing differential for corporate ESG bonds in the U.S. Uh, fixed income market, right? So even though we have 43 billion or so uh, bonds, ESG bonds in our muni market, uh, that just pricing differential is not as evident, right? Uh, that said, um, we have seen um, from time to time, and this is day specific and deal specific, um, the proclivity for anchor orders on certain maturities, particularly long maturities, 30, 10 years or so, to be upsized in, with green and social bonds in a pricing process to swing pricing leverage to the issuer to lower TIC. Um, the good news is, is that market technicals in the muni market are still positive for issuers, meaning we've got relatively low supply, real, real strong demand. So during this process, the marketing and underwriting process, we've targeted investors, particularly targeting ESG investors. And what we try to tease out is what are the metrics that matter to those ESG investors They may be enticed to upsize those orders? So for example, when we're looking at green bonds, yes, our investors care about sustainable activities like resource conservation and pollution prevention um, and restoration. But if you can include environmental uh, justice in that to address that, that might peak demand. When you look at their social bonds and yes, income inequalities, uh, educational opportunity gap, and wealth, wealth and income debt gaps matter. But if you have something about health and wellness disparities, that might peak investment demand. So by targeting investors, teasing out those metrics and trying to get those anchor uh, orders to be upsized, that can swing life, uh, leverage your way and maybe provide some upside for immediate issuers. 
That's great. But it's interesting that you said you're talking about kind of anchor investors, but we also have seen, and, and, and you've talked about this before, uh, uh, an increased interest also in the retail side of, of the market and kind of understanding, um, obviously, that that opens up a whole other, you know, kind of question of what are the metrics and how do you start to assess, you know, kind of what, what uh, you should be looking at and what types of metrics um, they would be looking for. So can you talk a little bit about kind of how you're seeing that shift in the market and some next steps you think are needed? Yeah, you know, again, in a primary market, still no quantifier pricing differential. We are seeing in the secondary market uh, some difference in how ESG bonds are trading relative to vanilla bonds, right? Uh, we have at, our, at, at Seabird a, a strong secondary trading platform geared tor towards professional retail. What we don't have is a centralized repository of information that our retail investors can go to to assess whether or not these actual issuances retain their sort of impact um, that they were promised in, in, in the primary offering. So that's something that we're struggling with. Um, but as we see more and more secondary trading here, that's going to be important. And I'm sure Mark Kim has an answer to that. <laughs> Mark's going to solve it. We have we have a few minutes left. Mark's already figured it out. We're, <laughs> that's why we're leaving him to the end to be the, <laughs> the grand finale. Um, no, that's great. So, you know, kind of in hearing about, obviously, the diversity of investor need, there's also, of course, in this market, um, the, the challenge around the diversity of, of issuer, uh, the type of issuer, the size of issuer. Lourdes, if I can go to you next, um, Lourdes Herman, who is the executive director of the Public Finance Initiative. And so, you know, kind of thinking about, you know, kind of if we could go a bit deeper dive into um, how you're seeing various issuers look at not just, you know, kind of some of the kind of traditional climate focus. Um, metrics and, and what they're looking at in terms of, of assessment and disclosure, um, but also looking at some of the, the harder um, kind of metrics to quantify, right, and to really have data around, which are, you know, often the, the social uh, metrics. And so can you give us some examples, maybe some concrete examples, so folks can really wrap their brain around what you're seeing um, in terms of, you know, kind of some of the best practices as folks start to, to, to better assess and quantify uh, social risk and impact? Sure. Um, and it's such a pleasure to join you today. I think that we, you have asked the million dollar question and we are asking that question at a time when the market is booming and also very nascent in many ways. And one question that we want to ask ourselves is what is a, an ESG bond? Is it just a self-designated issuance, you know, that where we see the label of green, sustainable or social? Or do we think that there's a wider set of securities out there, particularly given the natural overlap between social purposes and the very operations and purposes of municipal entities? Um, if we think back even to the 90s, qualified zone academy bonds, I would argue we saw some nascent activity on what we would call social bonds arising even then in the tax credit context. And when we think about the wide variety and scope and breadth of the market and its issuers and all and all of the sectors that could be financed under each label, what you measure is going to be really different depending on what you're financing. And I also argue depending on how you look at the integral piece of the plan of finance plays and how we think about the outcomes. So for example, if we were thinking about a housing bond with the label social, and that housing project is happening in what's called a qualified census, census tract or a difficult development area, you might see measurement around you know, the changes in composition of area median income, how many families are staying within certain thresholds, um, living either above or below the poverty line. Are we seeing a changing um, diversity of housing tenure in a way that also aligns to citywide outcomes for what we think is actually feasible, possible, and important when we think about the importance of housing in the context of equity and other social issues that the bonds seek to advance. And that's gonna also not just be specific to the sector, but also to the jurisdiction and what's measurable. Um, so you've seen there have been many studies by the Government Accounting Office even looking at mandated areas where in the tax credit context, you want to see what progress is happening beyond the financial outcomes. And there have been a lot of difficulties in measurement that actually limit and inhibit what story we can tell with rigorous data and econometric analysis. Um, and taking a step back from that, um, there's another piece of measurement that happen, should be happening at the issuer level that's really important to the market context that even Gary just spoke to, which is when you put forward the effort as an issuer to measure and develop a rigorous framework to describe what is social in that story in your official statement, is that impacting pricing, particularly when you go to the primary market to sell bonds for the first time? Um, to my knowledge, that is one of the biggest unanswered questions in our market for a couple of reasons. One, because it's hard even to wrap your arms around the changing nature of disclosure, where issuers are either, we would put them at the top of the spectrum saying these are mature practices to those who are very nascent and less rigorous. 
Um, I really believe as an early user of Emma Labs that we are going to see a real changing of the tide of information and the way that we can use it so that we can wrap our arms around that question more meaningfully and thoughtfully and hopefully start to, to build an alignment and say when we are seeing investors come to the table and issues are oversubscribed and we're seeing stronger pricing, can we find factors that you can actually say in social sustainable or green bonds lead to that? And is it tied to disclosure or other factors in what you measure? Um, and I'll end by highlighting one other point. I think that the challenges of measurement also become even more pronounced because we know that not all bonds come as a single issuance. We are also dealing now, and I've seen activity of refunding bonds labeled as social or designated with ESG labels, and also revolving loan programs where we know that there are a lot of underlying obligers and issuers who come together, particularly smaller communities who otherwise are gaining some efficiency by going through a public authority from a cost of capital and even cost of issuance standpoint. And you think in lower resource settings, what measurement practices are there? You know, and how do we equip those communities to do better? And will investors care about that in a way that will impact the pricing of an issuance? I think are some of the key questions. And we can go through some deeper examples as well um, later in the panel. That's great. No, thank you. And, and I think that that goes to, you know, sort of what are some of those kind of calls to action, right? And um, certainly we, Mark knows what it is and we'll come to him in a second. But, you know, I think that there, there are other um, you know, stakeholders, um, whether it is the investors, the issuers, the rating agencies, those who do affect pricing um, and, you know, kind of thinking about what are the critical next steps for them to, to really, um, you know, kind of better uh, think about that assessment and thus the pricing around social risks. Um, so, Olivia, why don't we go to you next? Because I think, um, you you know, as, as, you know, obviously the, the head of ESG and, and uh, a managing director at TC, TCW, you know, you're seeing um, obviously the demand. We've talked about the surge of demand, the oversubscription of issuance, thinking about, you know, kind of where the next steps are that you see as an investor and within the investment community, because again, you're not all one size fits all, you know, what are you looking for as an investor in terms of, um, you know, some of those best practices, whether it's on the quantification, kind of looking at what, you know, what risk assessment and, and impact assessment has been done, um, or even looking at, you know, kind of the types of and, and uh, functions through which you disclose, um, you know, really would love to hear some of your thoughts about kind of what what you're, what you're going to be demanding over the next year as an investor. Well, happy to make some comments here and thanks so much uh, for having me. Look forward to one day seeing everyone in human format as opposed to virtual format again, but we'll wait for another time for that. Uh, what I thought that I could do to kind of frame the conversation is to give a bit of an overview of what's happening in the green, social, sustainable, and now sustainability linked bond marketplace to give you a sense as to where the demand is coming from and what's motivating the, de the demand. Uh, then give you a sense as to uh, what are the benefits that we see for issuers issuing this type of debt. And then again, what's the motivation on uh, the investor side of the equation and where do we see that going into the future? And then what are the, expe uh, uh, the expectations associated with that demand function? So again, you may have seen it, but in 2021, there was uh, $1.6 trillion, $1.6 trillion of new issuance of green, social, uh, sustainable and sustainability linked bonds in the global marketplace. That's twice as much as what we saw in 2020, which was already a third uh, up from 2019, which was already a third up from 2018. Again, remember that 20 years ago, there was no green social sustainability linked bond market. And today we had a year where we had $1.6 trillion of new issuance. So there's a huge amount of supply coming to the market. And that's because we've seen an incredible amount of demand from investors all around the world who are seeking to invest along the lines of sustainability and are looking for these ESG labeled bonds as a way to align their investment portfolios to those ambitions around sustainability. I think what you saw in particular uh, in 2020, uh, but also to a certain extent toward the back half of 2019, was there was a pretty significant supply demand imbalance in the global marketplace where there was just not enough supply in the market for the amount of demand that there is in the marketplace for these types of bonds. And you did start to see pretty significant pricing pressure across the board from issuer type uh, in the marketplace, where you did see that kind of five to seven basis points of new issuance premium and what was called the, the greenium. And that was getting uh, pretty pronounced. We saw that through um, sovereign debt issuance, whether that was France bringing to market very large deals, Germany also bringing very large deals as well. Um, but also in the corporate issuance space. Uh, BMW came out with a, a very uh, big issuance in, in the fall of 2020. 
and that was very tight, uh, more than 20 basis points tight to their traditional curve. So you started to see some pretty significant supply demand imbalances in the pricing, uh, given the fact that there was more limited supply uh, than there was demand. Uh, what I think that you've seen in 2021, given this huge doublance, uh, uh, doubling of issuance, is that we um, started to see a better uh, pricing scenario where you saw that supply demand uh, imbalance come back into balance and you saw a little bit more uh, in terms of uh, on par pricing relative to the traditional bonds uh, of those same issuers. The conversation that we're having today reminds me a little bit of conversations that we had four or five years ago where we brought together issuers, uh, investors, and bankers together to say, how do we jumpstart uh, in the corporate credit space more issuance uh, in the ESG labeled bond space? Um, and there were a lot of questions from bankers and issuers that uh, asked the same questions. What's the value that we're getting uh, when we're adding so much resources in order to bring these bonds to market? And I think what you've seen over the past several years is that there are a variety of different benefits that issuers are bringing, um, bringing forth from issuing these bonds, um, some of which are diversified uh, investor base. Typically, when you see a green labeled bond come to market, you're seeing a different investor base go into that bond than what you're typically uh, seeing in the general uh, markets. Uh, and that's definitely true in the case of corporate credit. And I, I would imagine that it's going to be true in the case of municipal issuers as well. Um, in addition, you see uh, stickier investors. So they tend to stick with your issue and stick with your bond, stick with you through bouts of volatility. It's frankly on our side of the equation, uh, ESG labeled bonds are the last bonds that we would wanna sell even when we needed to raise liquidity. Um, so they're definitely a stickiness factor, a diversification of investor base, even if you don't get the pricing premium uh, that one could expect um, over time. Uh, I think that there are definitely uh, benefits from an issuer perspective, and it really harkens back to me to four or five years ago when we were having the same conversations with corporate issuers who now represent about 50% of the entire $1.6 trillion of new issuance last year. Um, in terms of demand uh, and expectations, um, we've iterated on, on many of the topics already in terms of disclosures, consistency of projects, programs, and their alignment to uh, principles like the international capital markets, associations, green bond uh, principles, social bond principles. There's kind of lots of frameworks to use to identify kind of what would be aligned to a green bond. As long as we're all singing from the same sheet of music uh, and kind of using the same taxonomy, whether that's kind of an EU-based taxonomy or other taxonomies uh, like the Climate Bond Initiative, who's outlined really excellent kind of orientation around uh, what are green, truly green projects and programs to finance under the uh, banner of a green bond. I think we were talking about it in, in the green room before, but I think expectations would be over time, we should see similar taxonomies outlined, harmonized, uh, and agreed upon in the industry for what are social bonds in the context of muni issuers, what are sustainable bonds, and what are the expectations in terms of disclosure, reporting on the impact of those bonds versus other bonds uh, being brought to market. So I'll just pause there. No, that's great. And I think... Um to your point, there, there will be an evolution, right? So some of this is, you know, what can you do right now um, when maybe we're not necessarily all singing from the same um, sheet of music just yet um, versus what can we do in two years, five years, 10 years, right? Um, can you talk a little bit quickly about, you know, kind of how you're seeing the role of technology uh, come in and kind of what your either wish list would be or, or what you're seeing that's already been successful um, in terms of, of utilizing technology to get a kind of better um, uh, balance, as you, as you said, uh, between kind of the, the supply and demand? Look, I think anytime there's a way to reduce the friction in, in any marketplace, uh, I think everyone benefits uh, from a pricing perspective and a transparency perspective. So I know uh, that we heard earlier from uh, Tammy Arnold, the CEO for Alpha Ledger, and all the incredible work that's being done in terms of blockchain technology for trading systems in particular, uh, very powerful for the municipal uh, space. Um, uh, definitely advents in technology like this can help accelerate and find uh, better matches between buyer and seller in the marketplace. I think Gary uh, alluded to this already as well, which is, you know, where do we have the repository for investors to kind of quickly go and, and better understand uh, what is being financed by these uh, ESG labeled bonds and what is the ongoing accountability and reporting and quality of those bonds on a go forward basis, uh, particularly when you see issuance uh, as Gary mentioned, um, some of which can be 30 year uh, paper, right? These are very long dated uh, uh, bonds. And we wanna make sure as investors that 
every year we're clicking along on the same set of, of data points and disclosures and outputs uh, that we all expected uh, when we bought into the primary market. So I think a repository for those types of data points and those types of uh, uh, disclosures and reporting is going to be very crit critical. So transparency via um, you know very clear trading platforms that allow for kind of an efficient uh, efficient um, you know brokering between buyer and seller, and then also having that repository for ongoing analysis uh, of the ESG labeled bonds in a way that's easy to uh, get to. I think would be huge. Excellent, and and leads us nicely to to set up Mark uh, Mark Kim, the CEO of MSRB. Mark, obviously, there's a role for regulators. Um, there is a lot that has been um, discussed already, but I think that you know, kind of obviously, uh, the MSRB in this space. You've come out and and had a call for comments and um, you know, recommendations uh, from stakeholders, but would love to hear your thoughts about you know kind of how regulators can both in the short term think about what existing systems are are there that we can utilize with some tweaks to to um, help get to what Olivia was just talking about in terms of the accessibility um, and and kind of where you see the opportunity for maybe even innovation in in some of the the processes that we have now. Thank you, Caitlin, for moderating the panel, and, and thank you to the Milken Institute for inviting the MSRB to participate. It's it's a pleasure to be here, and, and Caitlin, thank you for starting out by saying that there's a role for re regulators, because I'm not sure that everyone's agreed that with, with that statement, but I'm happy to address it. I think these are very exciting times uh, in our market. If 10, 15 years ago, you wanted to call together a panel to discuss ESG in the uni market, people would respond by saying, what's ESG? But look at us today. You can't go to a conference without talking about this issue. So our market's clearly evolving. And in my view, it's the responsibility of financial regulators to evolve with the markets that they're charged with regulating. To that end, as you mentioned, the MSRB did issue a request for information on ESG trends in the muni market. With respect to calls for action that you asked us to come to the table with, my first call of action to uh, the participants at the audience is to respond to our request for information. Um, we not only want you to respond, we need you to respond. This is your opportunity to set the record straight on the state of ESG in our market. This is your opportunity to help inform the MSRB and to help us better understand the challenges that issuers and investors face with respect to ESG in our market. So that's my first call of action. We've kind of set up this panel uh, with a supply and demand construct, and I think that's the right one. Uh, when we think about what's the role of a regulator here, or more specifically, what's the role of the MSRB, um, it's our congressional mandate to protect the supply side market participants and the demand side market participants. Congress created the MSRB almost 50 years ago to protect issuers and investors. So to your point, we have a very central role to play in my view in this conversation. Now, what brings supply and demand together in this market and in every market for that matter is data. And Olivia had, had touched on the importance of data. And again, the MSRB has a very pivotal role to play here because we serve, as you know, as the in industry central and sole only repository for market, in, for market data. I wanted to acknowledge the industry's efforts to develop and establish standards and best practices, particularly with respect to the data that is being disclosed to the market around ESG. The MSRB is eager to support and stands ready to help uh, support the adoption and implementation of these standards. Our role, so how do we protect issuers and investors? How do we meet our mandate with respect to ESG? Well, in my view, data is one of the key areas. Um, in making that data more transparent and more accessible, the MSRB is making significant investments in technology and in particular to our EMMA system. Um, my second call for action on this panel 
is to issuers and to the CFOs who may be listening on this call and considering uh, whether to uh, issue ESG or labeled bonds. Um, and that call to action is to submit all of your disclosures, including your voluntary disclosures to EMMA. And in return, my commitment to you is that the MSRB will work collaboratively with issuers to make the submission of that voluntary ESG information easier to do and uh, easier to submit and, and, and to provide issuers with greater control over how that information is transmitted to the market. We also are making a commitment to investors that we wanna work with you to make sure that we can make this information more accessible to you and that you can get what you're looking for more uh, easier than it is today. Um, so that's my second call to action. And, and, and Lourdes had um, alluded to what we are calling Emma Labs. And many of you may not have heard of Emma Labs. It's because the public launch of Emma Labs isn't going to happen until next week. So we get to break a little bit of news on this panel. And Lourdes was kind enough to serve as one of our beta testers for Emma Labs. We will be launching Emma Labs next week. This is um, a major initiative for the MSRB. It is uh, what I would characterize as a data analytics platform for the public and for investors and other market participants to come and see the power of new technologies and how they are going to uh, help reduce some of those frictions and, and, and some of those inefficiencies and hopefully some of the market e uh, information asymmetry that we see with respect to um, this particular uh, issue. So we're really excited about uh, the upcoming launch of Emma Labs. And again, please respond to our RFI and please submit your voluntary ESG disclosures to Emma. And we promise we'll make those transparent and accessible. Amazing. And so um, we only have a, a few minutes left and I, I want to, to pick up on the, the call to action and, and hear from some of the other participants um, as well. Maybe do a lightning round here um, for each of you of, you know, kind of one call to action to uh, someone who is, is listening right now in the audience, you know, one thing that they should really be focusing on, one thing that they should do this year um, to really help move this market forward. Mark, Starting with you, obviously, you just gave us a few calls to action, um, certainly, and, and the hope is that everyone uh, responds um, and, and sends amazing comments. But if there was one, um, you know, kind of additional kind of thought you had around maybe the market generally, not just even the role of, of um, regulators that you're hoping to see this year or that you think that, that members of the audience should, uh, should go back to their organization and do tomorrow. Sure, I'd, I'd be happy to offer a third call to action, and that is to apply to serve on the board of the MSRB. If you like what you heard today, if you care about the future of our market and want to have a hand, a seat at the table in the future of financial regulation and how we think about issues, emerging topics like ESG, there's no better way to do that than to consider serving on our board. And our nominations process is now open. And so I would encourage anyone in the audience that is uh, interested to consider applying. Excellent. Be careful what you wish for. Hundreds of people <laughs> who are now considering it. Olivia, why don't we go to you next? Oh, I'll be pretty quick here. Uh, the first is for investors. Demand more of your managers. Uh, tell us what you want. Tell us to be innovative. Tell us to find opportunities that better align with where you want your money to be put to work. Uh, that is really meaningful. It's really powerful, and it'll help push forward the asset management community. Um, and then second, from an issuer perspective, um, take the leap. Um, you know, look to uh, walk before you run. Uh, find an opportunity to um, identify projects that you knew uh, needed to be financed through bond issuance. Look to align to some of the international standards and, and take the leap to issue a bond um, along these frameworks. Uh, we're here as investors, um, uh, Gary's here as, as bankers, uh, Mark here uh, on behalf of policy, uh, Lourdes is here uh, from a, an academic perspective. We're all here to help. We all want to find uh, success in this space, and we all want to see this market grow uh, and for communities to be positively impacted and for us to create more climate resilience uh, in our local communities. So take the leap. Excellent. 
hopefully, uh, hopefully we see we see those leaps um, uh, across the year, right? Uh, Lourdes, why don't we go to you next? Sure. Um, so as I think we've covered the waterfront of all of the key issues, and I, one of the things we want to do is proceed with awareness of the difference between corporate and municipal markets, you know, and obviously the regulatory requirements that exempt municipal securities have created a purely voluntary disclosure framework for a lot of the issues that we've talked about with ESG. And I challenge all of us to think, what does the market need, particularly as we've seen the incredible and enormous growth, and we have many principles that do not lend themselves to rigorous and quantitative strong measurement, and what do issuers need to be supported when they're sent centering equity or centering other social outcomes in a bond issue. And in order to create that, to really be expressive and say, we think that these are the gaps, because I think that where we have enormous growth, we also have an, an opportunity in this moment in time to really think about how to not only push the market forward so that we see an expansion of issuance with that natural alignment to social purposes we care about, but to do so in a way that when we look at the market five years from now, we see social determinants of equity have changed. And we're actually seeing moving the needle across the issues that we all are committed to. And that's a lot of the work that um, we will be focused on in the years ahead. Amazing. Gary, why don't you, you take us home with uh, one thing you'd like the audience to walk away with or, or do tomorrow when they get back to their day job? Well, two things. First, I want to echo Mark's call for action on the MSRB board. I had the benefit of serving uh, uh, two terms, um, and I think it's a wonderful opportunity to contribute back to our marketplace. Um, you know, what keeps me up at night is that 61% of the ESG uh, mark uh, media bonds are self-verified, right? And we have to think about our market, as Lourdes mentioned, is not is this, this heterogeneous nature. Well, we got 50,000 issuers or a thousand different, I mean, a million different QCIPs, right? So how do we get uh, contributions from not only the state of California, which is a huge issue, but that small school district in South Dakota to be a part of the conversation as we call, develop these uh, uniform standards in the taxonomy uh, for, for ESG standards in the muni market. We have to bring our issuers in this conversation proactively um, to make sure that they're at the table when we set these standards. And that's something that I, I, I really... Uh, don't envy Mark in trying to get you know you know issuers with all these different diverse categories um, in, into that sort of marketplace of ideas. But we have to exercise some leadership in getting all our issuer types part of the conversation because they are going to be critical to how uh, we develop uniform standards in our marketplace going forward. Amazing. So thank you all in 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 an effort of bringing people around the table. And, and certainly uh, how the Institute also hopes to, to work this year and, and collaborate with so many of you. Um, one way that we're hoping to, to, to take the leap, as Olivia said, um, is work with uh, a group, a, a new consortium um, that has a really exciting initiative. So I, I'd like to, to bring on uh, Zoila Jennings, who is the lead impact investment officer for the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation to discuss actually a very concrete and, and uh, exciting initiative to really bring some some of those new ideas and standards around uh, equity and race in the muni market. So Zoila, why don't I hand it to you? Thank you, Caitlin. And thank you so much to the panelists for that ro robust discussion. I'm Zoila Jennings, Lead Impact Investment Officer at the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, here to answer a little bit of that call to action. Uh, we're not an organization you would typically expect to see at a conference on public finance, which is why I'm particularly honored to be here today to announce an effort to leverage the municipal bond market investments to disrupt historic systemic racial inequities, really focusing on the social side of ESG. So today we announced uh, that the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation will provide $4 million in funding to that powerhouse consortium partnership led by one of our panelists, Lourdes Germán, of the Public Finance Initiative, alongside the National League of Cities, Government Alliance on Race and Equity, Urban Institute, our host, the Milken Institute, and many others. And the initiative really sets out to develop that unifying framework we talked about for inter integrating specific equity criteria in the municipal bond investment process. And what we hope to do is provide technical assistance for cities and public authorities across America and create practical, usable tools to assess social outcomes. So the goal is really to show investors and other stakeholders on how to leverage the bond markets to advance racial equity and income inequality. So why does the nation's largest health foundation care about municipal bonds, you may ask? Uh, so the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation's mission is focused on improving health rooted in equity. So as we approach 
our 50th anniversary, we are more focused than ever on removing the structural barriers to health, primarily racism, discrimination, and their consequences. Public infrastructure investments like the ones funded by the Muni market play a critical role in creating access to public transportation, quality affordable housing, education, access to water, all of which are critical key drivers of health and well being. Uh, and so we are here today uh, to be proud and focused on the municipal bond market because we believe in the industry's ability to reverse patterns of historic disinvestment and neighborhood segregation. This is not a one and done effort on our part. We are in it for the long term. And you are all some of the leading thinkers and voices in our field. And we are honored and thrilled to be part of the conversation. We look forward to future engagement with all public finance stakeholders as we come together to scale up equitable outcomes for all. Thanks so much. Excellent. Thank you, Zoila. Thank you so much. Also, I hope the audience will join me in thanking the panelists. I think there's a lot of work to be done, uh, but certainly a lot of great work that has already happened. So onwards, uh, certainly as we look at ESG and the muni market for 2022, but also onwards for the rest of your day. So we are going to, to leave you for a few minutes. We're going to let you enjoy some lunch um, or some coffee if you're in a different time zone um, and maybe answer some emails. You'll still be able to keep the live stream open and and uh, you know, see the see the countdown for when we're back in about 30 minutes. But please, in the meantime, enjoy uh, the ability to stretch your legs. And if you're working from home, maybe go to the kitchen. Uh, but thank you all for the panelists for this amazing session. And we look forward to the rest of the day.